Welcome to the Grim Leftovers Show with Grimnir every Monday night at 7 p.m. Eastern on RealLibertyMedia.com and RLMRadio.xyz. Alrighty, folks, are you ready for another episode of Grim Leftovers? Because I'm here and I'm live, and it is Monday evening, March 16, 2020. So I hope you're all ready for another good old episode of the Grim Leftover Show. I'm bringing it at you, ready or not. <laughs> so if you're, uh, anyway, we're live here on RealLibertyMedia.com and RLMRadio.xyz for those of you that prefer the XYZ site. And I know there are some that do. So uh, come on over, jump on in to the chat here on RealLibertyMedia.com. You can also get to that on RLMRadio.xyz. Uh, go if you if you head on over to Freedoms Network or RealLiberty.org, they don't have our chat. So come on over, or or if you have your own IRC client, just go to IRC.freenode.net, and then once you get there, uh, hook on up to Pound Pound Real Liberty Media, and you'll be here in the chat with all the great folks that are hanging out with us here tonight. And we do have a group, great group of folks, a group great of folks. A great group of folks here, as we always do. <laughs> yes, the bots and the bodies. Yeah, we got we got bots like Barman and bodies like Cowboy Tech. Myself, the Moose Girl, Miss Kate. Hey, Kate, Moose Girl, how you going? How you gals doing? Uh, we got Anti and Asmodeus as no the Chalcedony. Miss Circulo, are you still awake? Miss Dam Van Mita, how are you? And uh. Free enslaved, free from the from star, the Kanakistan man, who nobody can go into Canada anymore. Canada is closed off, unless you're a Canadian. We got Miss Graham Z of the Java Doctor, Meister Meister Brow, Prince Prince, California man, uh, Rob works. How hey Robert? How are you? Trust no one, aka Rome's there. Uh, Vanna White, Vinny, the weather dork. That's given us all the good weather, as he do. Uh, the weather's nice. Yeah, it is nice. It's like 68 degrees right now outside of my house here. Clear, sunny. Yeah, all that fun, fun, wonderful stuff. We got Woodman and Phantom, Bruce Dickinson. Choskira Cyborg Noodle. Dima, 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 Dima. <laughs> I don't know how to say everybody's name. E-Man and n Sims and Gromit and uh, J.K.'s. Oh, boy. Pone Sauce, the Sock Puppet. Welcome back, Sock Puppet. He was gone for a few days there. We got the Smart Ass, the Holiest of Rogers, and Zippix. Those are the people in the list here in the chat. There are more people out there listening, though. I am aware of that. And uh, there will be more of you tuned in and listening um, as time goes on uh, uh, through the through the podcasts and the videos and the other things that get posted up around this stuff. Okay. It's a coronavirus world. We all know this, but I, me, myself, Grimner here, want to give you a little break, a little respite from all the coronavirus craziness during this short, short one-hour show that I do here for you. Uh, and, and I do have a couple of coronavirus mentions coming up in the show but from maybe a slightly different perspective than all of the <laughs> wild stuff you've been hearing. And I assume most of you are at home because, well, you're supposed to be home now. If you go out, you're making people sick. I keep hearing that over and over again. Oh, uh, yeah. And, and, you know, for those of you, Hansel, that like the Trump man, aren't you so lucky? He's on TV like every freaking day now spewing his nonsense. <laughs> All right. Okay, let's get into it here. <laughs> like I said, I have stories to cover that are not coronavirus uh, central. So um, hopefully that will be uh, uh, maybe a, a nice break for y'all. I, I don't know. Uh, it's, 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 it's an insane world. Uh, anyway, we're going to kick it off here with a Zero Hedge story um, uh, posted on February 14th. And again, 
because of the, all the coronavirus craziness and how they got everybody locked into their homes now, I don't know how, if this is even relevant any longer because do they need this if they know who you are and where you're at? <laughs> Here we go. The biometric threat. This is authored by a guy named Jayati Gosh from uh, Project Syndicate. And it's posted on Zero Hedge here. Around the world, governments are succumbing to the allure of biometric identification systems. To some extent, this may be inevitable, given the burden of demands, the expectations placed on modern states. But no one, no one, should underestimate the risks these technologies pose. Biometric identification systems use individuals' unique, intrinsic physical characteristics, fingerprints, handprints, facial patterns, voices, irises, vein maps, or even brain waves to verify their identity. Governments have applied the technology to verify passports and visas, identify and track security threats, that means you, and more recently, to ensure that public benefits are correctly distributed, whatever that means. Private companies, too, have embraced biometric identification systems. Smartphones use fingerprints and facial recognition to determine when to unlock, rather than entering different passwords for different services, including financial services. Users simply place their finger on a button on their phone or gaze into its camera lens. Uh, personally, the camera lens on my uh, cell phone is covered with tape. <laughs> so <laughs> there will be the, at least the, the front, the front facing one, not the rear facing one. <laughs> so there, there will be no gazing into camera lenses from my end of things. It is certainly convenient. Oh, the allure of convenience. And at first glance, it might seem more secure. Someone might be able to find out your password, but how could they replicate your essential biological features? But, as with so many other convenient technologies, we tend to underestimate the risks associated with biometric identification systems. India has learned about them the hard way as it expanded its scheme to issue residents a unique identification number, or AADHAAR, -A -A whatever that is, uh, linked to their biometrics. Originally, the ADHAR, I guess that's how you say that, program's primary goal was to manage government benefits and eliminate ghost beneficiaries of public subsidies. But it has now been expanded to many spheres, including from opening a bank account to enrolling children in school to gaining admission to a hospital now requires the ADHAR. More than 90% of India's population has enrolled in the program. Dun, dun, dun. Serious vulnerabilities have emerged. Biometric verification may seem like the ultimate tech solution, but human error creates significant risks, especially when data collection procedures are not adequately established or implemented. In India, the government wanted to enroll a lot of people very quickly in the ADHAR program, so data collection was outsourced to small service providers with mobile machines. If a fingerprint or iris scan is even slightly tilted or otherwise wrongly positioned, it may not match future verification scans. Moreover, bodies can change over time. For example, manual labor, daily manual labor, may alter fingerprints, creating discrepancies with recorded data, and that does not even cover the most basic of mistakes like misspelling names and addresses. Correcting such errors can be complicated, a drawn-out process. 
That is a serious problem when one's ability to collect benefits or carry out financial transactions depends on it. India has had multiple cases of lost entitlements, whether food rations or wages for public works programs, as a result of biometric mismatches. Oh, can't you just smell the biometric database coming your way over coronavirus? Can't you just smell it? If honest mistakes can do that much harm, imagine the damage that can be caused by outright fraud. Police in Gujarat, India, recently found more than 1,100 casts of beneficiary fingerprints made on a silicone-like material which were used for illicit withdrawals of food rations from public distribution system. Because we leave fingerprints on everything we touch, we are all vulnerable to such replication. And manual replication is just the tip of the iceberg. Researchers have created synthetic master prints that enable them to achieve a frightening frighteningly high number of imposter matches. Further risks arise during the transmission and storage of biometric data. Once collected, biometric data are usually moved to a central database for storage. They have to be encrypted while in transit, but the encryptions can be, and have been, hacked. <laughs> Nor are they necessarily safe once they arrive in the local foreign or cloud servers. In India, one of the web systems used to record government employees' work attendance was left without a password. <laughs> Allowing anyone to access the names, job titles, and partial phone numbers of 166,000 workers. These uh, three officials at Gujarat, Gujarat, Gujarat based websites were found to be disclosing beneficiaries, adhar numbers, and the Ministry of Rural Development accidentally <laughs> exposed nearly 16 million adhar numbers. Moreover, the anonymous French security researcher accused two government websites of leaking thousands of IDs, including the Adhar cards. That leak has now reportedly been plugged, but given how many public and private agencies have access to the Adhar database, such episodes underscore how risky a supposedly secure system is, or can be, as they say. <laughs> of course, such vulnerabilities exist, with all personal data, but exposure of someone's biometric information is far more dangerous than exposure of, say, a password or a credit card number, because it cannot be undone. We cannot, after all, simply just go out and get new fingerprints or irises. The risk is compounded by efforts to use collected biometric data for monitoring and surveillance as is occurring in China and elsewhere. In this sense, the large-scale collection and storage of people's biometric data pose an unprecedented threat to your privacy. And few countries have anything close to adequate laws to protect their residents. In India, revelations of Adhar program's weaknesses have largely been met with official denials. Denials! Oh, no, our systems are great. Rather than the serious efforts to protect users. Worse, other developing countries, such as Brazil, now risk replicating those very same mistakes as they rush to adopt biometric technology. And, given the large-scale data breaches that have occurred in the developed world, these country citizens are not safe either. And you aren't either. Biometric identification systems are permeating every facet of our lives, unless and until you, they call you citizens here, I, I refuse to do so, and policymakers recognize and address the complex security risks that they entail, no one, but no one, should feel safe. 
because, like I said, <laughs> with this coronavirus stuff, um, just be ready for some biometric data collection on you. And do you think the U.S. is any better equipped to protect your data, to protect your biometrics than India was? I'm going to have to go ahead and say, no. No, they are not. <laughs> Chloe's here, right, hey, Chloe? Uh, <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Oh man, I tell you it's it's a it's crazy, crazy. <laughs> All right, continuing on with the non-corona news <laughs> from the BBC on February fifteenth, and I and I found this title hilarious. Really, you ran out of places to look here, so you're looking somewhere else. Is that it? <laughs> Astronomers want public funds for intelligent life search. Yeah, we checked the entire Earth. Came up empty. We're going to start looking for intelligent life somewhere else. Maybe there's some out there somewhere. We don't know, but we know it ain't here. The head of one of the United States National Observatories says the search for intelligent life elsewhere in the universe needs to be taken more seriously. Dr. Anthony Beasley told the BBC that there should be greater government support for a field that has been shunned by government research funders for decades. His backing for the research of extraterrestrial intelligence, uh, SETI, I thought, isn't SETI shutting down? Uh, SETI marks a sea change to a field regarded until recently as fringe science. Well, yeah, you know, if you could find some intelligent life on Earth, then it might make it more logical, reasonable, to look somewhere else for that intelligent life. Uh, I mean, you're assuming that there is some. But just imagine if the rest of the, the planets out there, the billions of other occupied planets, developed in a similar manner as Earth. They've either all already killed all of themselves off, or they're they're just fighting against each other in in various wars, destroying their planets through all kinds of nasty things that they do. But they, but <laughs> but <laughs> if they came up the way that Earth did, uh, you know they're, they're probably already extinct. Um, if they were, you know, so many years ahead of us. <laughs> Dr. Beasley made his comments at an American Association for Advancement of Science meeting in Seattle. The director of the U.S. National Radio Astronomy Observatory in Charlottesville, in Virginia, said that it was now time for SETI to come in from the cold and be properly integrated into all other areas of astronomy. Dr. Beasley's comments came as one of the private sector funders of SETI Research announced that the Very Large Array, uh, the observatory here in New Mexico, would be joining the effort to detect signs of intelligent life on other worlds. Yeah. <laughs> the VLA, as it's known, the Very Large Array, uh, is a multi-antenna observatory and home to what is regarded as one of the best equipped telescopes in the world. According to Dr. Andrew Saibon, Simeon, leader of the Breakthrough Breakthrough Listen Science Team. That's a great name for a team, Breakthrough Listen. Okay. At the University of California, Berkeley SETI Research Center, the incorporation of the VLA would increase the chances of finding intelligent life by 10 or even 100-fold, assuming it's out there. We are now set for the most comprehensive all-sky survey for extraterrestrial intelligence that has ever been accomplished, he told the BBC. Equally important, according to Dr. Simeon, is the credibility that the VLA's involvement would bring to the field. We would like to see SETI transform from a small cabal of scientists and engineers in California, isolated from academia, to one that is is as much integral part of astronomy and astrophysics as any other field of inquiry. 
I applaud your effort, boys and girls. I assume there's girls on your team, women, <laughs> females of some of some description. <laughs> Breakthrough Listen is a privately funded project to research or to search for intelligent extraterrestrial communications throughout the universe. The 10-year project in 2016, funded by the billionaire Yuri Milner, to fund uh, to the tune of 100 million dollars. Uh, UK's astronomer, royal professor Lord Rees is the chair of the organization's international advisory group. He told the BBC that given the multi-billion pound Large Hadron Collider had not yet achieved its aim of destroying the Earth by creating a black hole. I mean, finding subatomic particles beyond the current theory of physics, government should consider modest funding of a few million pounds for SETI. I'd feel far more confident arguing for the case for SETI than a particle accelerator, he said. SETI searches are surely worthwhile, despite the heavy odds against success, because the stakes are so high. NASA once funded the extraterrestrial intel the uh, SETI group to the tune of $10 million a year, but the funding was scrapped back in 1993 following the introduction of legislation by some scumbag named Senator Richard Bryan, who believed it to be a waste of money. This hopefully will be the end to the Martian hunting season at the taxpayer's expense, the scumbag Bryan said. This has been no significant public, uh, there has been no significant public funding for SETI in the U.S. or anywhere else in the world, although so-called astrobiology searches for evidence of simple organisms from the chemical signatures in the atmospheres of other worlds, receives increased backing. At the time, the first few planets orbiting the distant stars were discovered, but it has been, uh, it was not known if this was the norm. We now know that it is. Nearly 4,000 have been discovered to date. It is this development, according to Dr. Semeon, that has persuaded many respected scientists that the search for intelligent life on other worlds should be taken more seriously. Ever since humans have looked up at the night sky and wondered, is there anybody out there? We now have the capacity to answer that question and perhaps to make a discovery that would rank as the most profound scientific discoveries in the history of humanity. Keep on looking, boys, because if you find some out there that is actually intelligent, well, maybe you can get them to come down here and, and clue, the, clue the planet in, because we know there's no intelligent life here. <laughs> I've been searching in vain for that intelligent life here on this planet, <laughs> and it just does not come up. Oh, wait, uh, I got this out of order. I mean, I mean, I'm going to do this one, then I'll go back to where I was. I had one, I had an article out of order here. Sorry, guys. <laughs> because they're out there, and they're looking. They're looking for intelligent life in deep space. Maybe those people out there in deep space are looking down here and saying, Well, we know they ain't too smart. We know they're trying to find somebody out here, but they can't find us. Let's send them a signal. CBSnews.com, February 11th. A mysterious deep space radio burst is sending signals to Earth every 16 days. Astronomers detect mysterious radio signals. Yep. A mysterious object in, gal in a galaxy 500 million light years away is confusing scientists, because there's no t intelligent life here, with its signals. It appears to be transmitting signals that reach Earth in a repeating 16-day pattern. But the re researchers are clueless. They have no idea why there's no intelligent life here. 
According to a recent study, this marks the first time astronomers have detected a reliable pattern in signals known as fast radio bursts, or FRBs. It's an important step in figuring out where the bursts originate. And whoever wrote this added a from there. That's not only redundant, but incorrect. So just put a period after originate and leave the word from off of there. I know. Sidetracked. <laughs> Grammar Nazi. All right. <laughs> Before now, such pulses appear to be random in timing. That changed when the Canadian Hydrogen Intensity Mapping Experiment Fast Radio Burst Project, whoa, that's the chime slash FRB, the, yeah, uh, discovered the repeating pattern. The recently detected FRB, known as FRB 180916, uh, dot J0158 plus 65, really, that's the name you decided to give this. That's the best you could do. All right, sends out bursts that last for four days before stopping for 12 days and then repeating. The first 28 cycles were observed between September 2018 and October 2019 using the CHIME radio telescope in British Columbia. We conclude that this is the first detected periodicity. Is that how you say that? <laughs> Uh, periodical, per periodicity of any kind in an FRB source, the study's author says. The discovery of a 16.35 day periodicity in a repeating FRB source is an important clue to the nature of this object. Scientists recently pinpointed the specific FRB to a spiral galaxy similar to the Milky Way, known as SDSS, uh, with a bunch of numbers after it, uh, similar to the other one that you don't care about, located half a billion light years from Earth, making it the closest FRB ever detected. Researchers hope that tracing the Burst's origin will help them to determine what caused it. And if there were any intelligent life here, they could probably figure that out. The first FRB was spotted in 2007, and the signals have mystified scientists ever since. They only lasted for a thousandth of a second, making them difficult to study. Hundreds have been spotted, but only a handful have ever repeated themselves, and they seem to come from locations all over the universe. While the cause of the repeating pattern is unknown, researchers said the FRB could be orbiting a black hole-like object, flashing its signal at a specific point in its orbital period. According to another study at the same, uh, looking at the same data, the pattern could be consistent with that of a binary star system containing a massive star and a dense neutron star. The neutron star could be emitting the bursts, which are sometimes hidden by winds caused by the massive, a massive friend. The fast radio bursts are exceedingly bright, giving their short durations, and the origin at great distances. We, we, and we have not identified possible natural source with any confidence, Avi Loeb, a Harvard Smithsonian Center astrophysicist theorist said. Um, anyway, uh, there is the one source, one source that most of these ignorant Scientists have generally ruled out aliens. Why are they ruling out aliens? That's the most likely source. But discovering more repeating FRBs may be the only way to know for sure. I know why they're ruling out aliens, because there is no intelligent life on this planet. <laughs> All right, all right, moving on. <laughs> so, for all of you, uh, all of you, for the one of you weed-hating Trump lovers out there, this will come as wonderful news to you if you haven't already heard it. For the rest of us, realistic people, 
that have some common sense, this will not come as good news to you. <laughs> Trump, the Trumpster, Trumpy, Trump, whatever you want to call him, threatens to pull federal cannabis protections. High Times Magazine, February 11, 2020, Caitlin Donahue. The president's new financial plan for 2021 fiscal year has dropped, and to few people's surprise, it features a massive uptick in spending on the military and border security and cuts to student loan assistance and social welfare programs. But what about the really important thing? What about cannabis? The news is not great. The document proposes the elimination of a rider that has kept the feds from interfering with state legal marijuana programs. Trump or originally expressed his support for medical cannabis states' rights on the presidential campaign trail, but when he took office, he filled the Justice, Health, and Homeland Security Departments with appointees who subscribed to the Reefer Madness School of Cannabis Policy. The president's bellicose border policy likewise hinges on the re-escalation of the war on drugs. In the 2021 budget is not all bad news for the future of cannabis. $17 billion has been set aside to fund a national hemp program, clarifying regulation and government assistance to the industry. So all you people that are out there and digging on the Trumpster, thinking he's so great, maybe you like to catch a little buzz from time to time. Too bad. So sad. Fuck you. Get off that Trump train. Now, not that you have any other choices that are worth a fuck, because they're not. <laughs> Oh, God. <laughs> All right, this next uh, article is really just a little uh, a little helpful hint, a little helpful hint. Um, for those of you that use Chrome, okay, Chrome has built into it, Chrome has built into it a little thing they call the software reporter tool. And what it does, if you have Chrome installed on your machine, the base Chrome, and you use Chrome. Uh, you actually don't even have to be using Chrome to have it to have it going. But you can you can stop it. But I'll get to that in a second. Uh, but but what it does is it scans your entire hard drive and all your attached drives too. By the way, uh, <laughs> for all the software and other stuff you have on your drive, and it sends that information back to Google. It sends information of everything you have on your computer. Back to Google. It's called the Software Reporter Tool, .exe. And G ghacks.net has posted an article here telling you how to stop that shit. <laughs> you have to go and look for it, but it's there, and it's not that hard to do. <laughs> not that hard to do. How to block Chrome Software Reporter Tool. If you run Chrome, uh, Google Chrome on a Windows PC, and monitor processes that run on that machine, you may notice the software reporter tool process eventually. The software reporter tool, the executable, is the software underscore reporter underscore tool dot exe, is a tool that Google distributes, forces upon you, with Google Chrome Web Browser. It is part of the Chrome Cleanup tool, which in turn may remove software that causes issues with Chrome. Google mentions crashes, modified startup or, or new tab pages, or unexpected advertisements, specifically anything that interferes with their browser, which may be removed by the tool. The software reporter tool scans the computer's drive and reports these scans to Google. <laughs> so Chrome uses the scan results to determine whether it should prompt the user to remove unwanted software 
from the computer as it impacts the browsing experience. Anyway, it gets into some of the technical details here, and you'll have to use this as a reference data sheet here uh, if you are running Chrome. Now, I have searched for this very tool uh, on, on Brave, which is a Chrome-based, Chromium Brave-based browser, and it's not there. Uh, at least that I could find, it is not there on Brave. Brave is not reporting back to Brave or to Google um, what, what the hell you're doing. Yeah, Cowboy Tech points out correctly. There's plenty other browser, plenty other fish browsers in the in the in the browser sea. <laughs> now I don't mind Chromium. I run that. Uh, well, I, I run it on my on my Linux machine, but and this and this is specific to Windows there too, the software reporter tool. So um, it may also run on Mac, but it's not running on Linux. Uh, it, but either way, the uh, the the software reporter or the software fink tool is not reporting on you uh, as you uh, do your whatever it is you're doing on your computer. Now, I told you at the top of the show, if you were tuned in at that point, that I was trying to give you a, a respite from all from, from all of the, the coronavirus crap, but that I mentioned that there's also, I did also have a couple things to talk about as far as uh, coronavirus crap goes. Although from a little different different way of looking at it than the way you've been hearing about it or are being inundated with it uh, by everybody else in the world. It's just craziness, the stuff that's going on out there. Uh, the, the <laughs> madness. Madness, I say. <laughs> All right. So this article on uh, golfnews.com posted up on uh, February 15th. Um, and I think, well, let's just, let me just go into it here. China tries 3,000 year old traditional remedy on virus patients. At the, at the point this article was posted, no drugs or preventatives had yet been approved against the virus. I'm pretty sure that's still the case. That no drugs or preventatives have been approved against the virus. Beijing, China, is administering centuries-old traditional medicine on patients affected by the coronavirus disease. Treatment in the Wuhan hospitals combined traditional Chinese medicine, popularly, popularly known as TCM, traditional Chinese medicine, TCM, and Western medicines, according to Wang, Wang Heishang, Wang Heishang, uh, the, the new health commission head in Hubei, the province at the center of the virus outbreak. He said TCM was applied on more than half of confirmed cases in Hubei. Our efforts have shown some good results, Wang said in a press conference on Saturday. Without elaborating, top TCM experts have been sent to Hubei for research and treatment. No drugs or preventatives have yet been approved against the virus, which has already claimed the lives of, at that point, 1,523 people in China uh, and affected about, at that point, 66,500 people. Just weeks into the epidemic of the novel coronavirus, reports of treatments and vaccines against those effect infected have caused pockets of excitement. The first reported use of an experimental Gilead Sciences, Inc. drug to fight the coronavirus has encouraged doctors to support further testing of that medication. Some 2,200 TCM workers have been sent to Hubei, Wang said. Wang is one of the officials at the forefront of an effort by Beijing to reset its approach to the epidemic after anger grew across China at the lack of transparency throughout the crisis that has shut down large swaths of the economy. Earlier this week, China sacked up the top leadership in the embattled province, including Wang's predecessor. Now, I don't know if you saw it uh, at some point last week, but there was um, a video and photos, images, of the people in Wuhan, all the medical care people, taking off their masks, 
declaring Wuhan coronavirus free. Is that because of TCM, traditional Chinese medicine? I'm going to bet that it is. Wang, who is also the, the deputy head of National Health Commission, was appointed member of Hubei's Standing Committee, the province's top decision-making body. Days after his appointment, Hubei announced a shock adjustment in its method of counting infections to include those diagnosed with CAT scans, a move that added nearly 15,000 cases to Hubei's total count and dashed hope the epidemic was coming under control. Hubei has been decimated by the crisis, at least that much, at least decimated, uh, by the crisis, and its medical facilities are at breaking point, while thousands of doctors have been sent from around China to the province to help, and two new hospitals were built in a matter of days, it is still struggling with the shortage of supplies and medical staff. There are widespread reports of deaths in Hubei and could have that could have been prevented but weren't due to a lack of medical care. TCM. Look into it. Think about it. Traditional Chinese medicine healing people. Western medicine failing miserably. But do you hear about TCM here in the States? No, you do not. Matter of fact, if you go out there and mention TCM on a blog post or somewhere and say, hey, this cures people, they will throw you in a deep, dark hole somewhere. They don't want you talking about traditional remedies, traditional Chinese medicines, herbs. They don't want to hear about it. <laughs> it don't matter if it heals people or not. Because... All they want is for Big Pharma to get the big bucks from people like you. All right. Woodman, I hope you're tuned in. And I know. There is, you're not going to find a link. Nobody's going to find a link that says, hey, the United States created this virus, sent it up to a lab in, in Canada, and the Canadians passed it on to the Chinese, and the Chinese released it to the, to the wild. You're never going to find any link that says that. Guess why? <laughs> However, you will find links like this one. Came out on Activist Post, February 19, 2020. Nearly 10,000 military personnel from 110 nations in Wuhan, China, weeks before coronavirus outbreak. Hmm. Hmm. An important update regarding Wuhan, China, which is ground zero for the coronavirus COVID-19 outbreak, now reported to have gone global as the Chinese government has now banned people in Wuhan from leaving their homes altogether. Sound familiar? All you people under lockdown, under self-quarantine, social distancers? <laughs> One aspect which is very interesting and has been covered extensively here is Event 201. The exercise simulating a global con uh, coronavirus pandemic took place on October 18. 2019, six weeks before the first case of coronavirus was reported in Wuhan, China. What not many people are talking about is that on that exact same day, October 18th, the, the 2019 Military World Games, 2019 Military World Games, held its opening ceremony, followed by U.S. men's soccer match in Wuhan, China, the gr ground zero of the outbreak. This report explores the possibility of covert operation, which may have coincided with this, this event, using the event to 
as cover to gain access to China as nearly 10,000 military personnel from 110 countries were all in Wuhan, China at the very same time, only weeks before the outbreak began. <laughs> Event 201. You want to you want to Google that? Look it up. Event 201. But I'm going to tell you not to Google it. Duck, duck, go it. Duck, duck, go it. Do not Google anything ever again. Duck, duck, go it. Event 201. <laughs> all right, all right. <coughs> And while the, while while this next article while this next article is um not necessarily coronavirus connected in any way eh you may want to look at it you know composting can mean a number of things and <laughs> generally human meat meat is not a good composting material um <laughs> It's actually a very bad composting material. It's actually uh, counter to to your typical composting methods. But here it is from the Guardian dot uk. Uh, Guardian what the, the, the Guardian dot com out of the UK. Um, human composting could be the future of death care. <laughs> Washington becomes the first United States state to legalize practices as interest in green burials surge in the UK. Imagine all the big death pits if people start dropping like flies. That they're just going to start big old, digging big old pet pits and, and throwing you in there with a, with, a, with a backhoe. It is viewed as a fitting end for a banana skin or a handful of spent coffee grounds. But now, people are being urged to consider human composting and other environmentally friendly death care options. Speaking before a talk at the American Association for the Advancement of Science Conference in Seattle, what do they know about science in Seattle? Uh, on Sunday, Lynn Carpenter Boggs, a professor of soil science and sustainable agriculture at Washington State University, said, death certainly is not the biggest environmental impact we have in our life process, but we can still look for new alternatives. Washington recently became the first United States state to legalize human composting, and UK funeral directors are reporting a surge in requests for green burials and other more suitable alternatives to burial and cremation. Carpenter Dash Boggs, who also acts as a scientific advisor to Recom Recompose, a Seattle based company that plans to open the fir world's first human composting facility next year, presented data from the pilot project in which six bodies were composted to test the safety and effectiveness of the approach. The process known as natural organic reduction. You know, when I die, I want to, I want to go undergo natural organic reduction. Dig a hole, throw me in. <laughs> Just leave me there. Uh, which turns a corpse into two wheelbarrows worth of soil in four to six weeks. Oh, lovely. The body is placed in a reusable hexagonal steel container along with wood chips, alfalfa, and straw. But in, for mine, instead of throwing me in with alfalfa and straw, just make that weed. So you can make, throw the wood chips in, that's fine. But instead of alfalfa and straw, just put weed in there so I, I can decompose along with the weed. By carefully controlling the humidity and ratio of carbon dioxide, nitrogen, oxygen, and the others, the system creates the perfect condition for a class of heat-loving thermophilic microbes that dramatically accelerate the normal rate of decomposition. It's a bit of a surprise that when the microbial activity starts up, that there's enough feedstock, a whole different class of organisms called thermophilic organisms, that become active, said Carpenter Boggs. 
The pilot found uh, the pilot found that everything, including bones and teeth, is reliably transformed into compost. Non-organic materials, such as pacemakers and artificial hips, are screened for and recycled. The soil was also found to contain low levels of coliform bacteria, an indicator of biological safety, meaning that relatives could safely scatter their loved ones' remains like the like ashes or use them to plant a rose bush or even fertilize a vegetable patch. <laughs> All right. I'll let you read the rest of this. Yeah, we're all going to die someday, Free, so might as well just turn us into compost. <laughs> compost me <be> with weed! <laughs> all right. Oh, man. <laughs> okay. High Times Magazine, May 14th, 2019. May 14, 2019. And for those of you I was speaking to earlier, the weed-hating Trump lovers, too bad, so sad for you. What experts have to say about the endocannabinoid system. Experts, endocannabinoid system. For decades, scientists and metal, mental, <laughs> metal, mental health drives you crazy. Mental health drives you mad. <laughs> mental health is what we all need. All right. Oh, and mental health physicians tried to figure out how THC worked on the brain and body, explained Dr. Paul Song, chief medical officer at the Calix Pete's companies. A significant breakthrough came with the discovery of the endocannabinoid system, or ECS, in the late 80s and early 90s. Additional research has since identified endocannabinoids as the cannabinoids produced within our own bodies, meaning you don't even need to smoke weed to have the effect, the positive effects of the cannabinoids in your own body. It's there already, whether you like it or not. The endocannabinoid system regulates and interprets a series of processes in the bodies, including memory, pain, reproduction, appetite, immune function, and many others. The two major endocannabinoids to be identified today are anatomide, an, 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 <laughs> And andamide, I tried practice saying this word earlier uh, <laughs> before I came on because I knew I wasn't going to be able to say it. A N A D A M I D E, anandamide, and 2 H E, or arachnidinogenic. You'll have to figure it out after yourself. In an email to High Times, Katie Stem, Stem? Not Katie Seed, no, Katie Stem, CEO of Peak Extracts gave a brief overview of the endocannabinoid system. The system consists of two main receptors, CB1 and CB2. The endocannabinoids are lipid-based neurotransmitters that elicit effects on the entire nervous system from your brain, if you have one, to your fingertips. Stem added, Although we have much to learn, it appears that in some situations, the ECS acts as a volume control for a variety of processes and factors, modulating the way our body interprets signals, whether they be pain, hunger, excitement, etc. Dr. Song added another significant benefit to the ECS, having this biological basis of therapeutic effects of cannabinoids has provided more credibility and justification for the medicinal use of cannabis. How THC and CBD interact with the ECS. This may be the part where people understand the endocannabinoid system more than they might have imagined. The reason why a person feels the effect of 
a high when consuming THC is because it binds to both CB1 and CB2 receptors, giving an effect through the body and the head feeds your head. On the other hand, CBD does not have the same effect on the receptors, but does have an effect by activating other receptors in the body. Stem elaborated on CBD, which she considers the most fascinating of the phytocannabinoids that have an affinity for the ECS, which also include THC, CBN, 11-hydroxy, uh, T, uh, THC, THC-V, <laughs> and on and on. CBD acts on the serotonin receptors and members of the G protein receptor family, which are entirely separate from ECS. There is evidence that it acts on the modulator for the other for for the way other cannabinoids act on the ECS. For instance, blocking THC activity or modulating the effects of other ECS stimulants. Cannabis is far from the only influencer on the endocannabinoid system. Other drugs interact with it, as well as an array of daily actions and lifestyle choices, ranging from sleep and diet to exercise, sex, acupuncture, therapy. However, it is far, far from a one-size-fits-all sort of assessment. Anyway, they go on to explain more detail here on this, um, and I'll let you get to that because I have one more little bit here to cover uh, about, the, about the endocannabinoid system and its wonders. It's wonders, I say. Uh, this comes from Canigma.com, September 13, 2019. And it's basically covering a lot of the same information. It is an overview of the endocannabinoid system. I don't even know if I'm saying that word right, endocannabinoid. That's the way it looks to me. That's the way I say it. <laughs> Throughout history and across civilizations, there is an extensive evidence of humans using cannabis for therapeutic benefit and to treat many types of ailments. However, our ancestors did not know why these plants worked or why they were helpful, but relied on anecdotal evidence and observation. Early knowledge of how cannabis works remained poorly understood until the last century. In the early 90s, researchers made a significant discovery that explained the therapeutic potential of cannabis plants a previously unknown communication system involved in the regulation of nearly every essential function in the body. The intriguing system of messengers and receptors was named the endocannabinoid system after the plant elements that led researchers to its discovery. Cannabinoids. All right, I'll let you go through it because it's... Uh, Fairly, well, a lot of it talks about the stuff I talked about in that previous article, uh, but also there there's a lot of uh, jargon involved here, and uh, I, I, I'm i not a real big fan of jargon, but there's a lot of good information, so uh, check it out. I, I really suggest you do. Uh, the, Ken, the Kenigma, Kenigma, C-A-N-N-I-G-M-A, Kenigma.com. So there's that. All right. I now release you back to your regularly scheduled coronavirus pandemic emergency freakout programming. <laughs> I'll be back. I'll be back next week with another episode of Grim Leftovers. Uh, check the schedule on RealLibertyMedia.com for all the rest of the shows on RLM Radio. Appreciate you being here, one and all. Really, seriously, do. Um, and uh, what else do I got to say? Don't touch people. Stay away from people. As a general rule, having almost nothing to do with coronavirus. <laughs> Just in general, for your mental health, stay away from folks is your best bet. Thank you one and all. I love every one of you. And we'll talk to you next time. 
Peace.